it's my pleasure to be here and share this really exciting topic with you guys today. So we're going to talk about amplifying the power of nursing, or what I see as how we can move beyond traditional nursing roles. Some of the outcomes that we're going to hit today are talking about non-traditional roles, companies that may employ these unique roles, also a little bit of a comparison on non-traditional roles compared to those roles that might be a little bit more traditional, and also think about how you can find and identify these more contemporary-based roles. So, Let's kind of start a little bit here with a level set. Um, as Erica said when she introduced me, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for over 30 years. I was a chief nursing officer for over 20 years. And even myself, I pivoted into a very different technology and innovation space. So these observations and insights are very much speaking from not only my opinion, but also what I've seen and experienced myself and, and definitely ways to help you navigate this. So up until now, if you think about nursing, the roles were pretty much typical roles, what we would anticipate and expect a nurse to do. They would be what I define as a more direct or hands-on kind of patient care, care delivery type role. Even though nurses work across the continuum as, as care deliverers, right, or even providers, we see nurses in acute care, post-acute care, outpatient or ambulatory areas. We see nurses in home care. We see nurses in, in school nursing. So generally, a lot of um, places that you would expect to see them. We also have leadership roles. You can be a charge nurse, a supervisor, a manager, director, a chief nursing officer. You can be a COO, a chief operating officer. You can be a CEO. So we see a much more traditional kind of plethora of leadership roles. And then even in academia, we see schools of nursing that obviously employ nurses as faculty. We see education, and that could be professional development, continuing education, nurse educators that actually work in the organizations where we provide care. We've had nurses in sales for probably 15 years, and, and that might be device sales, uh, hardware sales, EHR, things of that nature. And then I would say within the last 10 to 12 years, we've seen an increase in the number of nurses that are actually in informatics or EHR related work. And even there, you can assume roles as sales reps or customer relations, customer success managers, as well as um, more of those kind of deep in the weeds data types of roles. I'm going to ask you all a question here. So we'll tee up kind of our first poll. And this is really just to help us get a little sense of kind of who is on the call today. So if you can select your answer for that, we'll actually share our findings here momentarily. I'd be curious to see. Okay. So very interesting split here. So 34%, over a third, are still in these direct kind of patient care um, or provider type roles. Um, our next highest is other. So that's very interesting to me. Um, we then go to academia, education, professional development, then to leadership, and then finally into informatics. So very interesting um, information, and that kind of helps give us, uh, gives us a sense of where we are today. So thank you, um, thank you very much for that. So let us spend just a minute here to talk about the pressures that we experience in healthcare and in nursing, because that's going to inform how we think about roles in terms of the new roles and where we can find them. When you think about the pressures that have happened on healthcare and in nursing, 
we know there have actually been pressures for the last many years. Uh, within the last eight years, we've all been on the journey to value-based care. There are pressures associated with reducing costs, increasing access, increasing quality, while at the same time, reimbursements have decreased. And then think about how we've thrown a monkey wrench into that in the last 14 months with the pressures of the pandemic. So literally in just over a year, we've seen an explosion in telemedicine and virtual care. The acceleration of that rate has gone from large organizations providing maybe 1,500 uh, telehealth visits a month to providing 50,000 telehealth visits a month. We're seeing a shift in how and where care is provided, clearly a shift from inpatient acute care to outpatient care and care in the home. I was just reading this morning that the largest and fastest growing area of new care delivery is actually care in the home. And what's increasing in that space is actually intermediate level care and critical care delivery. So that's gonna be a fascinating area to watch. We've seen in the last 14 months a spotlight on inequity and disparity and racism that clearly is going to apply pressure to not only where care is delivered, but also the roles that we know of and the roles that will be created. Focus on the cost of drugs and the cost of healthcare. The emphasis on reducing costs is not something that is going to go away. It will only continue to ramp up, which is what we will experience through the rest of our careers, which means care is going to continue to shift to the least expensive alternative to provide it. And we're going to continue to see technology be uh, leveraged and act as a force multiplier as we look at reducing how much care costs. We've seen a focus on emergency or disaster preparedness, a rise of non-physician providers. And while we have not always experienced the wins that we aim for in nursing, we're seeing a push towards top of license practice for not only nurse practitioners, but even PAs. So this is something that will continue to be on the radar screen and it will continue to be an uphill battle, but one that we will gain more traction with. We also are experiencing a growth in technology enablement. And that really means the use of technology to help us deliver the care that we need to deliver in the right setting in the most cost-effective cost manner possible. So this is fascinating to me as we talk about pressures because the pandemic has basically shined a light on issues that we know that we have had in nursing. So we know that we entered the pandemic with a pretty large nursing shortage that it, it didn't exist because of the pandemic, but the pandemic is actually shining a light on the issues and it will in fact exacerbate it. So 2020 clearly changed nursing. This is actually a very informative survey that was uh, conducted by NurseGrid in January and February of this year. And it was uh, almost a sample size of 9,500 nurses. So it's interesting to me that based on this sample size, you'll see that almost a quarter of the nurses in the sample said that they alone plan to leave nursing by the end of 21. The good news is that three quarters of them don't have a plan to change. That's awesome. This survey has since been uh, validated by the ANA, and in their study, they actually learned that 18% of nurses plan to leave the bedside within six months, and 21% are undecided. So the remainder of that sample will stay as well. So we're, what you can see happening here is that while most nurses remain dedicated to direct hands-on patient care, those that are leaving are leaving uh, the care arena. That means there is tremendous pressure going to be applied to where they go. I don't believe that nurses will leave nursing. I think they will leave nursing as we know it. And that means there are several ways that we can actually see them assume future roles or other roles as healthcare professionals. 
The other mitigating factor here is the impact that mental health has played and will continue to play. That will really tell us if this rate accelerates or if this rate stays about the same. So it's time for another poll question. And again, my curiosity is going to get the best of me. But the question here, I think, is going to be interesting um, just to get a sense of the 250 of you or so that are on today's um, webinar to get a sense of if you yourself plan to change career paths in 2021. And if so, does this mean moving away from direct patient care? And again, I think that this is going to be helpful for us to understand, but also it will give you a little glimpse of the micro samples that we see right now in the nursing ecosystem and the healthcare ecosystem. There are a lot of competing factors and there's a lot of different tensions right now. Be curious to see where we get with this. Whoa, okay, literally nearly split. So, and again, this is only for those people that are go planning to change career paths. So we, this is not representative of 51% of the people on the call, but of those that are on uh, thinking of changing their career path. So, okay, this is fascinating to me because again, these are people that are really going to be looking for some of these non-traditional nursing roles. Excellent, thank you for that. All right, we're gonna try to move ahead here and, and talk just a little bit about who is transforming health. And when we think about healthcare, the pace of disruption and transformation was accelerated in 2020 and it remains operating at a very accelerated pace. So we're not gonna see this slow down and chug along as kind of what we knew in nursing or in healthcare, but rather it will coast along at a pretty accelerated level of disruption. So when you think about who is actually transforming health, is it healthcare organizations? Not really. It's tech companies. And let's think about that a little bit. You can start to see, if you make the leaps here, where these non-traditional roles are going to open. Because companies such as these, and there are thousands more, are actually the ones that are changing, disrupting, and transforming health. The organizations that you're looking at, even on this screen, every one of them has a chief nursing officer or a chief nurse executive that operates in the C-suite. So that alone is pretty amazing. When you think about who's hiring nurses, as we dig in a little bit deeper, we're gonna talk more about that. But again, you're gonna find that it's very transformative and disruptive organizations that are very contemporary for our time it isn't necessarily the more traditional organizations. We're seeing nurses become coders, programmers, designers, engineers, CEOs of their own health tech startups, CEOs of more hospitals and more systems. And we're seeing nurses jump into consulting and coaching. So really there are many ways that nurses can use nursing as a propellant to get into these other areas. Let's talk a little bit more about the changing landscape because that too is gonna to inform where you can see these roles popping up. And part of what we talked about in our objectives is really to give you some information on where the roles are gonna be happening. So if you can anticipate changes that are coming and you see players on the scene, I would love to give you the ability to predict what's coming as a result of that in terms of new jobs or new roles. So the shift in care settings that we're gonna to continue to see, in fact, there's a really good data point uh, from SG2, which is a healthcare consultancy that says, we dipped down so much in 2020 that even by 2030, we will just barely regain all but negative 1% of our inpatient 
admissions. So if you think about that, that means on our best day in the next nine years, care will be less 1% negative from where we were, meaning we won't need as many nurses, CNAs, PCTs, pharmacists, all the people that are uh, go into hospital-based care. And in fact, care will be shifted somewhere else. The continued rise of telehealth and virtual care, the rapid adoption of technology, the redistribution of labor, even the widening health equity gap, they all play into this changing landscape. Technology will continue to enable how we staff, licensure changes. We experienced some of those that happened as a result of COVID for um, practitioners and providers that are actually providing care. Literally overnight, March 13, 2020, the switch was flipped and that allowed physicians, NPs, PAs, to actually provide care over state lines. The, the employment model is continually being um, pressured. And what we're seeing there is that the old traditional loyalty model, whereas you actually worked for an employer and that's where you got your benefits and your insurance and you had a schedule and you showed up when they told you to, that's really being challenged. And much of that is a result of different generations. So millennials um, that don't find that a very satisfying employment model. And in fact, what we've seen, again, thanks to COVID, is that agency and travel is really become the new long-term employer of choice. And the benefit there is that because that challenges the loyalty model, we're actually seeing nurses work for an agency or two almost as though they are their agent, where they can determine when they wanna work, where they wanna work, what region, what climate, what kind of unit, what kind of patients. They can pick the staffing that they decide they want to work for and sign the agreement. So there is a tremendous amount of leverage that the nurse has in those equations. And that isn't just important for nurses that want to go in and be a care provider in those scenarios or a caregiver, but also think about how this industry is changing and it continues to grow in terms of the number of what I'm gonna call more corporate office type jobs are available through agencies to work with a bunch of nurses, almost as their virtual manager to help position them for the assignments they want and find them uh, their next assignment. And we're seeing even specialty agencies pop up. There are specialty agencies that focus on nurse practitioners. There are specialty agencies that focus on telehealth staffing only. So we are saying, seeing an increase in real sort of niche players in this space. And there's actually a startup company called Wheel that I'm familiar with here in Austin, Texas. And they were early in the scene on this specialty staffing and they have a tremendous following. So we're gonna continue to see much more of that as well. So it's very entrepreneurial right now. Nurses continue to look for the resources and support to make them successful no matter what role. We are seeing a big increase in self-employed and sole proprietor nurse entrepreneur type companies, a big increase in nurses who coach. And coaching is certainly everything under the sun from leadership coaching to life purpose coaching to career coaching. Uh, one of the fastest areas of coaching, there's actually two, is around wellness coaching where nurses, we certainly know the wellness milieu and can coach clients on that. And the second, is cannabis nurse coaching. So as more states are making cannabis legal for medicinal and recreational purposes, there are nurses that are very successful running cannabis coaching for clients. And much of that has to do with understanding the actual cannabis. So you can recommend certain doses or certain uh, strains for patients that have anxiety or depression or insomnia or fatigue or um, nausea due to perhaps uh, cancer treatments. So this has opened up a complete new Pandora's box for us. 
And we're also seeing changes made to education. So this will just blow the doors off what we currently know in academia, right? That's been a very rigid traditional model, very difficult and resistant to change. So we're seeing not only diseases demand to be educated in a different way, we're seeing that there are so many changes in the landscape that traditional education models aren't going to work anymore. So we're going to have no choice but to incorporate virtual reality and shorten the production cycle of creating new nurses. So imagine the point in time, and literally we are less than three years away from this, where when you go to nursing school, not only will you get your stack of books or your online books, you also will get mailed to you your Oculus virtual reality headset and loaded into that will be all the hands-on scenarios that you will have to test out of and become competent with as a student before you can actually move through the educational model. So this has great application in terms of how we can not only make education faster, more cost-effective, also better outcomes and safer. So Think about how this informs the new jobs that come up. So in again, in my opinion and in my experience from what, everything that I've seen going on in healthcare and nursing in particular, the shift from acute to home opens up tremendous opportunities in models of care, whether it's home care roles. Again, you can go all the way up the food chain, everything from that direct hands-on caregiving person to managers, directors, chief nursing officers, chief operating officers, CEOs, market level people, sales people, quality people, everything along that spectrum in home care. The same is true in telehealth. Everyone from the person who is actually doing the assessment, sometimes the form gathering, the review process, you can be on the payer side and work with insurance companies, or you can actually work with providers. There are now so many large physician practices that use telehealth. They also are having their own office staff tee up these visits for them. So there is a tremendous opportunity in telehealth. And again, there certainly are education changes that go in that as well. Think about the roles that are going to continue to open as we shift backwards and start to make up for some of our lack of investment in community and public health roles. So we are seeing a growth and an explosion in public health agencies around the country actually adding a plethora of nurses, of MAs, of technicians, of lab people, of quality people. So that lack of investment has taken us backwards. We have all seen that as a result of the pandemic and uh, certainly as a result of the new investment, um, the couple trillion dollars of investment, we're actually seeing new jobs open up that are being paid for with federal dollars. Media, social media roles are opening up and influencers, we're seeing more nurse influencers than ever in social media. So that people are actually turning that into million dollar incomes, believe it or not, there is a lot of money to be made there. Media roles, I believe we will continue to see nurses expand their visibility and amplify their voice in media, and we will see them actually on uh, TV channels, as news reporters, as radio um, kind of hosts, and we're going to continue to see this shift, and I'll tell you why in a minute. We're going to see more advocacy and policy influence and opportunities. So we have three nurses right now in Congress. There is a tremendous opportunity for more nurses to run for office because we need people to understand the importance of public health and nurses can bring that and inform those conversations and policy. Leading health equity and population health, literally jobs every day are opening up. You'll find them on LinkedIn or Indeed or places of that nature and you can see health equity roles. Health technology is growing by leaps and bounds. And one of the fastest areas that's growing is actually RPM, remote patient monitoring. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a couple slides. Nurse coaches, we touched on some of those fast growing areas such as well-being, life wellness, and cannabis coaching. Lots of entrepreneurs and startup CEOs that are nurses. We've had some very successful nurse exits. That means selling their company. In the last five years, we've had a $30 million nurse exit 
a $25 million nurse exit and several $10 million nurse exits. That means nurses started these companies, worked them, built them, grew the valuation, grew that value, grew the users, and then sold them. So tremendous opportunity there and crazy cool things going on with startups uh, in health technology that's led by nursing. And certainly we're seeing growth in other areas as well. So the reason that I think we're going to see nurses in all of these areas is because particularly as we think about nurses that are no longer of that more traditional mindset, nursing is really a philosophy. It's a way that we were trained and it's an underpinning in how we think. We think about others first, we lead with customer service, we're incredible problem solvers, and with this, it actually allows us, we've become amazing innovators and leaders. So we can apply that to any scenario or any other advanced degree that we might get and any specialty that we attain. Now, that doesn't mean that going into non-traditional roles is the only way you can pursue or sort of leap ahead right now with a nursing degree or in healthcare. Some of the more traditional roles continue to grow in terms of the scope, the visibility, the stature, the paychecks, the scope, the responsibility. And these can also be amplified at higher levels. So think about not just the direct patient care jobs, but as you get those experiences under your belt and you start to pivot, whether it's into leadership, you also can then look at roles that are more regionally based. There is travel with, associated with a lot of those. In the past, nurses have been somewhat reluctant to travel. Some of that could potentially be attributed to the fact that it's still a 90% female-dominated profession. As we open the doors to these kind of things, nurses absolutely have the ability to escalate and move quickly into CNO, CNIO, um, chief nurse policy officer, COO, CEO, roles at the system level, the regional level, and we're seeing that happen at places like HCA, Tenet, Stanford, UC Health, um, UI in Indiana, Banner. We're seeing that happen at Kaiser. So there is tremendous opportunity to get in those roles. We're also seeing nurses with the appropriate training, whether that's a master's in health innovation, an MBA, a master's in education, a PhD in research, we're seeing nurses actually become faculty at medical schools, business schools, public health schools. So tremendous opportunity from a faculty position. So I would just pause to say, there are so many opportunities that the only way you can't move ahead is if you hold yourself back. So let yourself think very broadly and very openly about that. So in nursing world, one of the fastest growing opportunities that we're actually seeing is among this uh, telehealth role for nurse practitioners. So this is actually 18 months old. So the salaries continue to increase. So if you think about this, you know, almost a quarter of a million dollars annually, plus pretty great benefits working from your home is a pretty amazing position, right? And think about the impact that you'll make doing that, how many patients that you're gonna be able to see. You're also gonna make some pretty meaningful contributions to that. So this is really pretty cool stuff. And this is where nurses have the opportunity to grow. So again, I would say, try to aspire boldly and big and don't hold yourself back there. This is a blend of traditional and P practice in a new setting, right? Telehealth. Certainly there are some nuances and things that you need to learn to get good at virtual care, but absolutely an area that's growing. And again, there are there's micro segmentation. So you'll find the staffing agencies that are actually looking to place people. And it isn't all about money. It needs to be about a good fit for you. It needs to be a value proposition in an organization that you can contribute to and be recognized for your hard work. And of course, make a decent paycheck. 
So there are a lot of opportunities out there and they all require some investigation so that you make the best decision for you based on what you're looking for and how you want to contribute. Let's shift gears here just a little bit and talk about why it's so important for us to um, really amplify nursing through non-traditional roles. I think traditionally in nursing, people have us in a box. And I speak on the future of nursing frequently, and I speak to lots of different audiences. And it never stops astounding me how many different professions and individuals have us in this, this really neat and tidy box that as nurses, we must generally be women, we must generally be very compassionate and want to hold a lot of hands and we cry a lot in the photos and we're very empathetic and they know we're good at, at providing care and we're just so darn sweet and trustworthy. That's awesome. But I think we've done ourselves a disservice in the media because nurses are also rock stars and we can really kick some butt. So you think about the position that we are in because for the 19th year we've been voted the most trustworthy profession we already have a platform to amplify what we do and who we are we can focus on leadership we can focus on technology sales consulting because we're master problem solvers and critical thinkers design and development whether that's in architecture or whether that's in technology. We actually have designers that are working now that are nurses, went to school for a, a master's in design and are actually working in innovation labs, helping to design processes, models of care, devices for patient care delivery. Clinical operations and applications from a technology perspective, I talked yesterday with a nurse that has literally invented a new platform to uh, decide how many staff a hospital and a unit need that's different than how we're doing it today. And it's crazy cool stuff that nurses are coming up with. Education, we've already talked about how that's gonna completely need to be disrupted. So there's a tremendous opportunity there. Visibility and thought leadership is something that we're all amazing at in nursing. People want to hear what nurses have to say. And much of it has to do with the fact that we are trusted and do have that very strong sense of integrity and authenticity. That's already a bonus card for us to play. And again, think about your role in contributing to policy. I'd love to encourage nurses to actually run for office. It can be the school board, it can be city government, it can be a state position, or certainly a national position. We absolutely have to amplify what we bring to the table. And then when you think about leadership, think about outside traditional roles. So not just that nurse manager, nurse director, chief nursing officer, Think about other organizations. Maybe it's a telehealth organization. Maybe it's a consulting organization that are looking for leadership. This is what we do. We can put band-aids on things literally and figuratively better than anyone else. Everything from how do you staff a unit that is already short to how are we going to uh, you know, quickly shift from our EHR in our downtime to paper to how are we gonna collect data to how are we gonna make an impact on true social determinants of health. So we have a tremendous skill set and competency base from which to draw from. So this all seems well and good. Quite often, one of the pushbacks I get is, hey, wait a minute, Bonnie, why would we want people to do something other than be a bedside nurse? So that's a great question, right? I think a couple of reasons. I think everybody isn't satisfied delivering care anymore right? We don't have to do it the way we've always done it. You don't have to rise through the ranks of med surge to critical care, to be a director, to be a chief nursing officer, and now all of a sudden something magical happens and you can be a good leader. We don't have to do that anymore. That's blown up. 
Let's do it differently. So why should we not allow other industries to experience the value that nurses bring? Think about how we can change the impact and the output. Think about how we can contribute to improving the experience for patients or clients, how we can increase the engagement for the team, whether they're nurses and healthcare professionals or whether they're someone else. And we understand clinical burnout better than anyone because resilience is a tool in our tool belt. So why not add us to the team? Nurses also have so much to offer and share with more people. We tend to be sort of Switzerland when you think about this healthcare ecosystem. So that's one of the reasons right now that nurses are so critical to being engaged in the vaccine conversation because we are viewed as being Switzerland. We're not gonna put our bias in there. We're gonna follow the science and really help educate people on what's important to care for themselves. We also can increase the visibility of what amazing things nurses can do by taking our careers outside of the traditional walls of nursing. Also, I think that because nursing is a philosophy and a mindset and a way of thinking, it's more than just your skill set. It's, I don't know, often we say nurses are called to it, which might be true. Many of us were but it's also a passion that we have because we want to make an impact. We wanna make the world better than maybe we started with, right? We wanna leave something very positive behind. So it's a great way for us to use it as a recruitment tool to even increase the future supply of nurses because we're always gonna need nurses. And by only selling nurses on bedside patient care or outpatient care, I think does a disservice to everything that we have to offer. Think about your own competencies and skill sets. We all get pretty good at knowing immediately in the grocery store just by hearing a cough who might be a smoker or by looking at legs, who might be a diabetic, or by looking at that frail person in a crowd, who you should keep an eye on in case they go down in the heat. We know those things because we're nurses and we've been trained, but it doesn't mean the only place to use that skill is at the bedside. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. That's a call for you, but now the opportunity is really yours because that door is open so much. And it could be a paradox. If more nurses move away from direct patient care, you could say, who's gonna care for the patients? We already have a shortage of nursing. How are we gonna backfill this? Well, I think we're gonna see changes in how we provide care. So quite often I'm asked the question, is nursing gonna be high touch or high tech in the future? Yes, we're gonna be both. It doesn't mean we have to sit and hold everybody's hands and cry with them, but it does mean that we're human beings and we're gonna be compassionate and empathetic and deliver human-centered care. It also means that our care is gonna be tech-enabled. It means that we absolutely are likely to see our nursing, what we call this terrible R word for ratios, it is very likely in the next several years that nurses, a bachelor's prepared nurse, may be having 20 patients that they care for in a shift. But before you freak out, let me tell you why. It's because technology-enabled care means that every patient has to be connected to a vital sign monitor, a heart monitor, an EKG machine, a Dynamap, a temperature probe. We need inputs. We need data that tells us what's going on with that patient every moment. We also will be supervising a team of licensed and unlicensed personnel. I believe absolutely we need a resurgence in that role of the LVN and LPN. We've tried for years to minimize that role in acute care, and I think we've seen that we need that role. There are not enough registered nurses. There are clearly not enough BSN registered nurses. So we're not gonna be able to fight our way out of this paper bag. We're gonna have to look at a team-based model that we use technology as a force multiplier. I think that we're gonna have to move away from these bulky carts on wheels and come up with something that's much easier to document. There are currently um, something that's very similar to Google Glass that is already being worked on that will allow us to document in our EHRs, allow us to take pictures of wounds or dressings or lab values and send them off to someone if we need to send them to a provider for some kind of an order or a review. 
Stuff like this is already being worked on. Remote patient monitoring or RPM. We are already seeing, as a result of the pandemic, hospitals that have brought it into their med surge rooms, not just their ICUs, but their med surge rooms. And initially it was brought in as a way to mitigate the risk for nurses so that they didn't have to go in the room as frequently. Now it's still in those rooms. That expensive technology isn't just going to be mothballed. We can use that to allow people on the other end to answer call lights, to educate patients on their admission or their discharge medications. We can um, get informed consent that way. We can use this technology to do so many things that could allow us to have fewer direct registered nurses and more of this licensed and unlicensed personnel that support those roles. So I absolutely see that this is going to change for us. Let's talk a little bit about how you can actually learn about these roles, because this is one of the trickiest parts to more non-traditional or these sort of modern contemporary roles. These roles can be a little bit of a challenge to find, okay? Oftentimes, they're word of mouth. You can find them in LinkedIn. And to find them in LinkedIn, it's imperative that you have an up-to-date LinkedIn profile. And really, you want to make sure that you use the smart search words because LinkedIn uses AI algorithms that scour for recruiters literally real time 24-7. So it's important to have the right keywords in your profiles if you're looking. There are also a couple tips. You can show that you're open to employers to learn more which is hidden from your current employer. So there are ways to explore jobs that might be something of interest to you. Also important is do your own online research. Maybe figure out who are the top 10 companies you aspire to work with. Is it Facebook? Is it Google? Is it Amazon? Is it Walmart? And just put them in your browser so you literally have a tab saved and circulate through them on a regular basis, looking for the news, things that they're doing, and also looking on their career pages because you'll see new things pop up all the time. And then think about how you can build your network. So it's important to know who's in the jobs that you are interested in and maybe talk to them, figure out how they found that job, what they do in that job, so that you have a sense, make sure that you like it before it's something that you really think you want to springboard into. And also, here's the most important thing, and, and I coach people on this frequently, and this is kind of my secret sauce on this. Do not look for roles that say you have to be a nurse. Look at all the roles. Because if you go on and have an advanced degree, if you have a master's in informatics, in healthcare innovation, you have an MBA, you have a master's in education, you have a doctorate, do not box yourself into a role that requires you to be a nurse. That's just an extra bonus. So think about that because it's a tool in your arsenal. It's a skill that you have, but it doesn't have to be the skill that you lead with because very few of these jobs say this is a nurse tech person. This is a nurse research person. So keep your options open. Think broadly and really think about how you can start to zero in on what interests you and how you can dig into what's available and what's out there. All right, that felt like it flew by really quickly. So uh, you guys can find me, I'm on Twitter, but you also can find me in LinkedIn under Bonnie Clipper. Um, and I just started, you'll see a new podcast that was launched and I do talk to a lot of very interesting people. You can listen to those and see if there are roles that you're interested in and there as well. Um, but feel free to reach out to me in LinkedIn and I can point you in a couple directions. I'm happy to do that. Whew, that flew by for us. So Erica, if you want to open it up to any thoughts or questions, I would be delighted to entertain those. Sure. Are these trends in the nursing roles seen across all of North America, including Canada? Or are they more specific towards the U.S.? Uh, no, they are absolutely in Canada as well. Uh, and in fact, Toronto has the most robust kind of uh, health tech and innovation scene, and they are booming with roles for nurses. But again, you're not going to find them if you look for a nurse tech person. How can a nurse find positions in consulting for construction? 
Ooh, that's a great one. Um, so I would start with a couple things. For me, what I would go to is I would identify what are the top 10 consulting firms for construction. And then I would start there. And literally, those are the tabs that I would kind of uh, bookmark on my browser. And I would start to get very familiar with the companies. And I would start looking uh, at kind of careers within the companies. Um, for me, I also tell people look at um, Glassdoor or Indeed to actually get the inside scoop on those companies to make sure you that's a good fit for you or you identify with one that you really want to work with. Uh, and then also just keep looking on a very regular basis. Maybe you dedicate, you know, two hours on a Saturday morning or a Sunday night to doing this kind of search, but you have to do it regularly. Otherwise, it's like buying a lottery ticket. If you just do it once in a while, it's really then a matter of luck. What other online areas are helpful for finding unique RN roles other than LinkedIn? That's a good question. LinkedIn is the number one, and you will find those through a variety of ways. Search them by the company. You can also search them through the keyword function. Uh, you also can go into um, Indeed. And they and Glassdoor as well. I like Indeed better. They have a pretty good search feature that will allow you to search by keyword function and also by region or location to determine uh, positions that might be of interest to you. What is the most versatile MSN degree to have? Okay, you're asking me a baited question. So um, I apologize in advance to all of you that are immediately going to. Um, unlike me in LinkedIn. Um, I do not see my personal bias is that an MSN is very valuable if you're going into education, not so much if you're going into other things, unless you also accompany that with a dual degree. So the things that we talked about that are really growing are areas around business, innovation, and um, informatics or technology. So if you get an MSN, try to load up on me as many of those other courses as you can to really round out what you can do with that MSN. What are your thoughts about micro-credentialing as compared to another advanced degree for nurses wanting to expand their skill sets? It's awesome. It's an awesome way to supplement and uh, build onto your credentials. So unfortunately, in healthcare, we are this kind of letter collecting group. And you'll even see this here on my credentials as well. Um, we're a letter collecting group. Many of those are important because in a way what they do is they actually tell why you are um, credible and why you have the expertise that you have. Micro credentials are awesome because they can help you dive deeply into a niche that you can highlight for segmentation. So it's a way for you to differentiate yourself amongst others. And it also allows you to learn. And in fact, there are several great, great ways to learn. And many of those are free to you on Coursera, Udemy, or um, edX. Any suggestions about starting a business in consulting services? <laughs> yes, that's a completely separate conversation. Uh, absolutely, uh, people do it all the time. So nurses are very successful in this space. Would you recommend healthcare analytics certificate programs to provide a competitive edge as a candidate or are these skills self-taught? Uh, certificate is a street cred kind of thing. So it's a very valuable tool, particularly if you're looking to differentiate yourself. Would you recommend getting your MBA? Would this help with getting business related jobs within companies? 125%. Absolutely. And in particular, you notice that's actually one of the the degrees that I've collected in life. That was um, one of the degrees that I think has absolutely been the most valuable for me because it brings you, it gets you a seat at the table, which is incredibly valuable and very important. The other thing it does is that when you have an MBA, as I talked earlier about looking at those jobs, you don't need to search for anything that says nurse because now you have an MBA and that opens the door to millions of jobs. How would you encourage nursing students in pursuing these roles? 
So, um, you know, my advice to nursing students is once you get out of school, you got to get your sea legs about you. You actually have to understand how to give care, even if it's only for 12 to 18 months. Then you can really think about what's your next pivot. There used to be a point in time that unless you stayed in a job three to five years, you were a job hopper. That isn't the case anymore. So new grads getting out of school, you need to be giving care for 12 to 18 months to actually understand the process, the workflow, the outcome outcomes, the lingo, everything about it. Then from there, feel free to hop back into school or to pivot into something different. Do you know if these nursing roles apply to the United Kingdom? You know, there are a lot of roles um, over there. Even the NHS has a lot of different informatics and data analyst type roles that are built in. And I, based on what I know in my experience there is, I don't believe there's any reason that a nurse could not apply for those because you absolutely, if you're trained, you have that skill set. I have heard that nurse writers are in high demand. Where's the best place to look for writing opportunities? So I would say there that's um, that's interesting and it's tricky a little bit. So you can always publish, right? If you want to uh, publish any kind of an article in any peer-reviewed journal, they're always looking for that kind of work. If you're interested in publishing a textbook, I would start by reaching out to some of the large textbook textbook companies, the Wiley, the Lippincotts, etc., and see, you know, pitch your idea and see if there's a need for that. And you can kind of go from there. Uh, otherwise, if you are um, a faculty, you can certainly work through your school to see what your school has expertise, expertise in and see if perhaps you can actually lead a project for your school to produce a textbook in a very specific area. I always say, um, it, you know, it has to be better than the last one or more current than the last one, or it has to be a niche because at some point people are going to make a choice and say, which textbook do we want? So it really needs to be something that's either better, faster, and smarter, or in a niche area that other people aren't in. All right, Erica, are there any other questions that we can answer for today? Those were awesome. Is a DNP degree versatile also? Yes. Uh, depending on the school that you go to, um, a doctor in nursing practice. Again, it's a practice degree. It's not a research-based degree. So a DNP, again, that's one of the credentials that I acquired. It allowed me to go very deep into uh, leadership and operations. Um, is it hard to break into other roles after you have done patient care for many years? No, there's a couple of things that you're going to need to do to distinguish yourself. Again, it depends on your education. So if you have uh, training as a nurse, uh, uh, you know, um, an ADN, a BSN, that's awesome. And it would be really helpful if you have any certificates. It would be helpful if you are the person that's always volunteering for a specific type of project. And what that means, if you don't have the advanced degree, it just means that you're probably going to be starting as a staff level team member in a different organization to really learn more about that particular industry or skill before you can move up. But absolutely, you can do it. And do you know how many nurses are working in non-traditional roles? No, that data is extremely difficult to find, but I would love to find it. So if anyone knows, please shoot that to me. I've not been able to uh, identify it. We do know how many uh, informatics nurses that are out there, and I'm sorry that I actually didn't pull that number, uh, but we do know that. You said the value of a DMP depends on the school. Do you have suggestions on ways to evaluate different DMP programs? You know what? That's literally just a matter of a couple of hours and an adult beverage, right? Because you're going to have to sit down and figure out um, what region are you in? Are you looking for uh, something that's remote? Are you looking for something that's hybrid or in person? And then start to dig into those schools. Every school has a different price point, and then they all have different specialties that they focus on. So you really can do a little bit of uh, kind of homework on Google and then just dig in and do some reading. Once you identify five schools, maybe even three schools of interest, I would try to connect with people that have gone there and see what they think of the programs. 
Thank you so much to our presenter today for all this great information. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with this audience and look forward to hearing more from you in the future. As a reminder to our attendees, please submit the state or country you are from in the questions feature. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars, podcasts, and resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Also, previously recorded webinars and podcasts are freely available on the repository. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful day.